Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Is this great. So I'd like to welcome back those of you who were with us yesterday evening for the first of these lectures and welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time. I'm Deborah Crone, professor of early modern cultural history here at the Bard Graduate Center. And on behalf of our director, Susan Weber, and Aaron Glass, who is associate chair for research programs, I'm pleased to welcome you to the second lecture of the spring's three-part Leon Levy Foundation Lectures in Jewish Material Culture. Here at Bard Graduate Center, we study the human past and cultural history through their material traces and the complex ways in which decorative arts, designed objects, and material culture mediate our own relationships with the past in the present. Our MA and PhD students do this work together with the faculty and fellows, cognizant of our own location in time and space. We're situated in three landmark buildings on the Upper West Side, in the heart of Lenape Hoking, the ancestral territories of the Leni Lenape people, and one block away from the former site of Seneca Village, a community of African American and immigrant property owners that was forcibly relocated to create Central Park. We gather together to hear about Jewish material culture at a precarious moment in Jewish and in human history a distressing time of war in Israel and Gaza, as well as Ukraine, ongoing civil conflict elsewhere in the Middle East and in East Africa, and a time of rising anti-Semitic and anti-Islamic sentiment, a time of calls for decolonizing and diversifying our academies, museums, and cultural institutions, and a time of global climate crisis. It's in this spirit that we are grateful to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this lecture series in Jewish material culture, which over the past six years has supported distinguished scholars to give three related lectures and then to publish with us on topics related to Jewish households, diasporas, and archeologies span ranging from Roman Empire, the middle medieval Islamic world, and 19th century New York. In these various temporal, spatial, and thematic contexts, I'm honored to introduce this speaker, tonight's speaker, Jonathan Bandov, who will address us on his research on text and material culture in ancient Judea. Dr. Bandov is professor in the Department of Bible at Tel Aviv University, where he studies the interconnectedness of ancient cultures. His work explores biblical literature and the Dead Sea Scrolls, among other forms of Israelite and Jewish literature, in comparison with the cuneiform corpus from Mesopotamia, as well as with Greek and Roman literature. He has also looked at evidence of knowledge of natural sciences through the early Jewish texts dealing with astronomy, astrology, calendars, and medicine. His other area of focus is literacy and writing in the Bible and in Jewish literature, positing models for the development of the early text of the Torah. He's been a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World across the park, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study at Durham University, and has received many other awards and grants, including the prestigious Michael Bruno Award from Yad Hanadiv. This semester, he is Siggy Feigl Visiting Professor of Jewish Studies in the Faculty of Theology at the University of Zurich. He has published widely on calendrical texts, the history of Jewish sciences, and early texts of the Torah. He's currently co-director of the German-Israeli project Scripta Qumranica Electronica, which aims to enhance the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls using digital humanities methods. The title of the three-part series is Encounters of Text and Material Culture in Ancient Judea. This evening, we'll hear about the material of apocalypses, rock reliefs, and the literary imagination. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Van Dock to the podium. Thank you, Deborah. That was very kind. Um, yeah. I think this is it. 
I thought that might be not the best idea in these times to speak about apocalypses. Um, but uh, I, I, well, there's hope. And let's, let's keep on our hopes for a better world. Um, so I will begin. I'd like first to say that uh, it's my second day of fellowship here in, in, at Bard Graduate Center. I'm impressed by the kind of work that the place is doing. Very interesting. The way you work with materials and material creation and connect them with ideas and thoughts and what to do about them. So it's more than just an arts institute. This is why actually I'm very happy to be presenting this kind of material here. I think that the, the students that are present or some faculty or the general public I hope to bring up on the agenda some kind of new ways to think about how matter or how material relates to thoughts, to literature and to text. Uh, we had something of a very different kind yesterday. Today we will speak about something different, but uh, never material nevertheless and uh, literary, imaginary nevertheless just as well. The material will come in kind of the second half of the talk, but maybe, well, about a third through the talk we will speak about, and that will be a very different kind of material. Okay, so Apocalypse. Yes, everybody remembers that film. When I say Apocalypse, so some people, this is what comes in their mind, this movie Apocalypse Now. Uh, other people will think of the four writers of the Apocalypse and the book of the Apocalypse from the New Testament. Other people would think about the end of the world in Jewish texts, but this is not what I mean. <laughs> so, as you will see, when we scholars speak about apocalypse, we are speaking about something a bit different. I mean, we our definition contains also that kind of apocalypse, but we speak of a wider definition, a wider concept of apocalypse, which I will present now in a few slides so that we will, you know, clear the ground for what I'm going to speak about in the coming 40 minutes, something like that. So, in Greek, apocalypsis is hiding or secret, like you remember the, the nymph Calypso from the Odyssey, yeah? Uh, so, apocalypsis is about telling the secrets, revealing secrets, apocalypses. Uh, so there was a genre. We will see the timeline very soon. Well, we are talking about Hellenistic Roman Judea, Hellenistic Roman Judea, uh, a genre of writing of apocalypses. People were writing texts in which they revealed secrets. What kind of secrets were they revealing? They were revealing secrets in time and secrets in space. So the readers of those texts, some of them have come to us, we will talk about them soon. So the readers of those texts were experiencing uh, the revealing of secrets, secrets in time, that is, times of the past, stories about primordial events, stories about the flood, stories about the fallen angels. This is like the constitutive myth of apocalyptic literature. We will speak about that later. The angels that fell on the ground in the time before the flood and took uh, human wives and so on. Yeah, so we will talk about that. This is like, so the reader of these apocalyptic books is getting new knowledge that he or she did not know and they would not have known about that unless some apocalyptic prophet or seer would tell them about those past events. So these are the past events. Uh, of course, the apocalypse is also tell secrets in the future. That is, for example, the end of the world. So they would give the calculation of the times until the end of the world and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that's uh, now this is one of the secrets revealed in the apocalypse. Hence the what people call apocalypse today. Uh, but apocalypse also tell us about secrets in space. They would tell us about travels, otherworldly travels of the apocalyptic protagonist, whether it is Enoch or Adam or Moses or Daniel. No, Daniel doesn't travel. But uh, other people, they travel and we see the secrets that they reveal as they travel. This is fantasy literature. It's, it's in, in antiquity. It's the, it's the fantasy literature of antiquity. Uh, they go through the seven heavens. They see the angels. They see the stars, they see the ends of the earth, they see the judgment of the wicked in hell. 
uh, what you read through Dante, yes, the Divine Comedy is a kind of a grandchild of apocalypticism in the medieval period. Uh, they see the underworld. So these are the secrets that are revealed in the apocalypses. So I keep calling all of them apocalypses because they reveal the secrets. And actually, I will not speak today so much about the end of the world, but I will rather speak today about the revealing of, of you know, secrets of the past and, and cosmology, of the cosmos. No. So, a very rough timeline of the period we are talking about. This is Judea. Uh, credits are due to my daughter, who did all the graphics. Chen uh, um, is her name. She's doing very well. So, uh, BCE, we're starting with... So, just to, to be clear, what we call the he, the period of the Hebrew Bible, so the kings of Judah and Israel, and Ezra and Nehemiah, and the restoration of the second temple, this is all here. This is outside. So the, the interesting part about this talk is that we are actually speaking in a non-canonical period. All of the writings that came through this period of time are not contained neither in the Jewish canon collection of authoritative writings, nor in the Christian, most of them, except for like very small relics, the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Uh, so the, kind of, the stories of the Hebrew Bible are here. They're outside the graph. Uh, we are really talking about products of the Hellenistic period with Alexander the Great conquering the space of Judea. Uh, as I said, this is very general. The Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, revolt later on. Uh, the Hasmonean state lasts for about 100 years. Um, Roman occupation, then Pilate, and of course, the story later on, the stories you know, uh, the Jewish temple is destroyed in 70 CE, then move on to another revolt, and I'm ending it there with the Christian, the, the Roman Empire becoming Christian with the Byzantines, but, but I could end it anywhere else. Now, of course, apocalypses continue afterwards, but I will be speaking about this formative period of time. Um, talking about the canons, so the authoritative writings of Judaism and Christianity, they took part more or less here. The rabbinic corpus, the New Testament corpus, okay? There are some experts here, I need to be careful, uh, but I hope to get your approval. Um, in the back, the experts are in the back. Uh, but the period of formation of the literature I am talking about is really through the third century BCE, the second century BCE, the, the last century is BCE. This is really the period I'm talking about. And today I will really focus on the third century BCE here. And let me just say that the third century BCE is in a way in Jewish history is kind of a black hole. We really know very little in Jewish history about the third century BCE. That is, when the Hasmoneans come, we have information. There's the book of Maccabees. We know more about that. You know, books that were written then under the Maccabean dynasty, the Hasmonean dynasty. We actually know very little about the third century, what the Jews do in the third century BC under Egyptian Ptolemaic, yeah, Egyptian Hellenistic rule. What did they study at the time? What did they write at the time? What concerned them? So actually the text we will see today, it, everybody, yeah, people were very surprised to know that these are third century BCE texts. So some characteristics of that period in the East, uh, Hellenism in the East. Once again, thanks to my daughter for the graphics. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure everything is really fitting, but uh, yes. Okay, so these are, we are talking about very ancient cultures, uh, Judeans, but also Babylonians and Egyptians, all coming under the great, the great Hellenistic empires. So. They are very ancient cultures with thousands, so millennia of tradition, millennia of very rich literature and religion and so on. And now they are facing this new power that comes and they need to come to terms with it or maybe vie or compete or maybe accept it or maybe they need a whole new thing must be created when this clash came about. Some people were hostile to the new culture. Some people were actually receptive of that. And so there's this new cultural amalgam what that we call Hellenism. Hellenism contains elements from the 
of course, from Greece, but it contains elements from the East as well. Hellenism, when we call Hellenism in the East, this is not 5th century BCE Athens, you know, this is not the time of Plato, uh, 4th century. This is really a new creation that collects all of these things together under a Greek roof. A uh, hybrid of Western and Oriental religions and a nice, interesting presence of Zoroastrian heritage. So uh, Persian, uh, there was a Persian empire ruling the East for 200 years and just until up until Alexander. And much of that knowledge of that uh, Iranian empire and the culture and some religion, religious ideas of that empire are inside this cultural amalgam. So, who are the people who wrote those apocalyptic books? I mean, well, I'm not speaking about the people who wrote those apocalyptic books, but the people who purportedly wrote them, because every apocalyptic book does not say, I am Moses ben Elazar from Jerusalem writing this book. They always say that the book was written by an ancient primordial seer. The earlier, the better. This is the model of authority. So they would pick up people, either people from before the flood, like Adam and Enoch and Noah. So you would have the book of Adam or the book of Enoch. Of course, it was written in Jerusalem in the second or third century, but they would give the authority, hinge the authority on this ancient seer. Or there are stories about the courts of the great empires, like Daniel. And much of that, you get up, this is what the Jews did, but much of that also exists in other ancient cultures around them. So in that Mesopotamian culture, we've seen some of it late, uh, earlier today, yesterday. So you've got early heroes like Gilgamesh and Adapa, and you have court stories, just like Daniel, very similar to the story of Daniel. I don't know how much you're familiar, but go ahead and read it. It's an interesting book. Uh, so stories very similar to the Judean book of Daniel, we have them within among non-Jews, written in Aramaic, and we discover more and more of them now in Egypt as, as, our, as discoveries continue. So those ancient seers, this is a nice medieval drawing. It's, it's medieval, but it's very nice. I like it. It's a drawing of Ezra from, from a Latin manuscript. Uh, and Ezra has many books. You see, he's sitting by his bookshelf uh, because Ezra was a scribe. Ezra is a, one of the very favorite apocalyptic protagonists. And why is that? Because he's a scribe. So reveal, secrets were revealed to him and he wrote them down. Actually, one of the apocalyptic books, we have a famous expert here for that book of Fourth Ezra, tells about Ezra writing 94 books. 24 of them were made public and these are the books of the Hebrew Bible, and the 70 others are the important ones where hidden wisdom is kept. So this is, a, there's, this is about secrecy and about revealing secrets, and therefore these, image, these people were, the, were yeah, made the apocalyptic seers. Enoch, who was a famous scribe, as you may know. Ezra, Baruch, who was a ma minor figure. He was the scribe of the prophet Jeremiah, but he was chosen to be the apocalyptic seer because he is a writer. And then Daniel and Levi and Noah and Adam. So we are speaking very ancient here. So in that time, at the third century BCE, this is a very nice example. I will speak about the, ma the material of this text tomorrow. Uh, today, I will just speak about the content. So two of the early writings of this genre are a book of astronomy, a book of astronomy in Aramaic. Who would have thought that this is uh, sacred, revealed knowledge of Jews in the third century? But this is it. And a book of the story of the fallen angels. We call them the Watchers. Long story. Maybe I'll say that afterwards. But we call them the Watchers. And they are both later contained in the book that we now call the Book of Enoch. Or the Book of One Enoch. So these two apocalypses. Let's have a look at them. These apocalypses uh, were contained... Uh, in a, a Jewish book written in Aramaic, but Jews then rejected it because it was too but it was too radical for the establishment. Therefore, it is not in any of the canon we know, so the Jewish establishment really left them away. The Christian establishment mostly left them away, except for the Christian Church of Ethiopia, where on the right hand you will find many 
manuscripts in Ethiopic of the Book of Enoch, where it still is a sacred book until today. Uh, excavations have found a Greek copy of the Book of Watchers, the Book of the Fallen Angels. This is a sixth century copy. So a lot of the work we do as scholars is, uh, is detective work. We are finding out the manuscripts and working with them and so on. So uh, revelations, what are they containing? Heavenly space and time, the luminaries, earthly space and time, past events, the fall of angels and Enoch's mission. So we will speak today about the fall of angels. Uh, this is a well, an early modern painting, not, of course, uh, not an ancient one, but you will see ancient points coming soon. So as we read, first we read in the book of Genesis that the angels saw the daughters of men, of mankind, and they thought they were nice, and they took, fell down on earth and took them as wives, and uh, giants were created from them, or heroes were created. So here is how the book of Watchers or the book of Enoch is telling the story. Then this is about this band of uh, rebelling angels. They swore together and bound one another with a curse. And there were all of them 200 who descended in the days of Jared onto the peak of the Mount Hermon. We will speak about that place. It's in the north of Israel and the border of where today is the border of Syria, Lebanon, Israel. And they called the mountain Hermon because they swore and bound one another with a curse on it. Uh, note, make a note for yourself about the Hermon region. We'll speak about it. And then these and all the others with them took for themselves wives from among them, such as they chose. And they began to go to them and defile themselves through them and to teach them. And here is the great sin of the fallen angels, actually things that lasted through the Renaissance. Uh, they taught them sorcery and charms and revealed to them the cutting of roots and plants. And they conceived from them and bore to them great giants, and the giants begot Nephilim. They would, and the, Nephil, the giants were devouring the labor of all the sons of men, and men were not able to supply them. And the giants began to kill men and to devour them. And they began to sin against the birds and the beasts and creeping things and all the fish and devour. So these are the outcome of the sin of the fallen angels. This is a very powerful myth. You should understand that for... A large part of Jewish and Christian history, many people shaped their understanding of history by means of this myth of fallen angels, which we will investigate in this present talk. So there's violence there against humans and against animals, but there's also knowledge. So this myth is really about the revelation of knowledge to humankind, which the myth considers to be a bad thing. I'm sure you all know another story in which the revelation of civilization to mankind is considered a sin. Prometheus, that's right. But also the story of Eden in the book of Genesis, the paradise. Yes, and they ate, eating from the fruit of knowledge is a sin. So here is that version of revealing knowledge to uh, civilization to mankind as a sin. Uh, and they taught men to make swords of iron and weapons and shields and breastplates and instruments of war and metals of the earth and gold and fashion it to silver. And he showed them concerning antimony and eye paint, which is a grave sin, of course. Uh, all manner of precious stones and dyes. And then they taught them spells and the cutting of roots and sorcery and the signs of lighting flashes, astrology, signs of the stars, signs of the shooting stars, signs of the earth, signs of the sun, signs of the moon, and so on and so forth. This is, in a nutshell, the story of the fallen angels. It's a, it's a very powerful myth that we will try to investigate. Now, there's another book that tells us about other, uh, the sons, the giants, the son of, of these fallen angels, what they did. This has an ancient, interesting history of its own, which we will not talk about, but these are the giants. They have fantastic names. Uh, they are one of the giants interesting is called Gilgamesh, which is, which is a very typical, interesting. It's one of the few mentions of the Mesopotamian Gilgamesh outside of Gilgamesh. And one of them has a Phoenician name, Achirom. That's interesting also for us. Um, so this is a continuation of the fantasy of, of the story of those, those fallen angels, the watchers. So Jewish mythology, the answer is yes, of course. This is Jewish mythology. So for some of us, it would seem a contradiction. Uh, how could it be? Is there any kind of thing as Jewish mythology? The answer is, I mean, at least for this, yes, there is. this is a Jewish 
full-fledged mythology. Actually, how much full-fledged, I won't try to examine that question, but this is really Jewish mythology. And you can imagine, I guess, why later on the rabbis really rejected that book. Yes, the rabbis were not very keen on Jewish mythology, although some people would say that they had their own Jewish mythology, just, just phrased, I mean, in a different way. Yeah. So Jewish mythology, but then far-reaching elements of the myth were later rejected, as, as I said. So, but we have that mythology now just through looking at texts. So we read the book of Enoch, as scholars like me and the people here, we read the book of Enoch and we try to understand and explain them and so on. But could it be? Could a myth operate with only a textual component? Think about, you know, Prometheus you mentioned or, or you know, whatever myth, other Greek, Babylonian, Icelandic, whatever myth you think about. It's a holistic thing. It has... Rituals, myth and ritual go together. And a visual component and some material culture, there is a myth in order to be operative. A myth couldn't just operate with the story. Even as a boy, I was reading stories of the Greek myth mythology. I'm sure each one of you had these kind of books. And they had these beautiful drawings of, of the hero, you know, Apollo and Athena and all of that. But how could a myth operate if this, and we know it was operative, and a very powerful myth. Uh, but what kind of other holdings did it have? What, what made it operative in the world with just text? So, what, so this is the question I was asking myself. Is there a material culture of the Book of the Watchers, of the, of the story of the Watchers, of the giants and the fallen angels? What can we say about it? I was, con I was really concerned with that question for a very long time until I came up with a kind of an answer. I, which I will present today. But first, I'd like to, for the theoreticians among us and the historians among us, this is a very influential uh, New York historian, uh, Mary Carruthers, speaking about the book of memory, the craft of memory, about mental images. So uh, when monks in the medieval period, when they, so they had an idea, a story to tell, but they connected that story with images and they drew those images in their manuscript. So uh, a lot of art relates on a memory that lies behind it. Uh, so I'm really trying to ask the kind of questions that Mary Carruthers is, is asking, but relate them to the kind of myth that I have. What, what is the mental image behind it? Or was there an image that's not mental? Was there a real image behind it? Okay. So the story begins here. This is another book from the same genre. It's the Book of Jubilees. It's a bit later than the Book of Watchers, but it really is part of the same world. And so it says about Kainan, one of the post-flood heroes. Now look well, and this is what this is the, the actual the actual point of the story. So Kainan, the boy grew up. His father taught him the art of he went to look for a place of his own where he could possess his own city. He found an inscription which the ancients had incised in a rock. He read what was in it, copied it, and sinned on the basis of what was in it, since in it was the watcher's teaching by which they used to observe the omens of the sun, moon, and stars and every heavenly sign. There's a lot to unpack here. I'll try to work it, to work it out. So he was looking at an inscription that the ancients had left, and that inscription, what was in that inscription? It was the knowledge of the fallen... Remember, yes, the Book of Enoch, that the fallen angels had taught astrology and so on and so forth. So he's found it on an inscription. It's a, it's a topic that people in antiquity were very much concerned. If all of civilization was given to humankind in antiquity, how did it survive the flood? Did you ever concern yourself about it? Many people in the were concerned about that. How did it survive the flood? So some of it was taken on the ark, yes, but some of it was written on, on the rock. And since it was written on a the rock, then it survived through the flood because it's, it's durable, a rock would survive. So this is the story about Kainan reading the ancient teaching of the watchers from the rock. So I was asking myself, the author of the Book of Jubilees, a Jewish writer in the second century BC, so what did he have in mind? What did Kainan see? What did he, so is it just a story or did he have a visual, like a material thing to think about? And then 
I thought, well, maybe he did. So and here is our material part of the talk. So this is one example, we'll see many more, but this is an example from Jordan, from the south of Jordan. It's a rock inscription uh, by a Babylonian king. This one is King Nabunaid. Uh, this is taken from afar, so it's far away up on the rock. Actually, you can't see it from underneath. This is, it's very public, but it's not meant to be seen because if you walk on the path behind it, you just don't see it. It was rediscovered in modernity just maybe 20, right, something like that, 20 years ago. Uh, and when you come closer, this is what you see. The king, there is a writing in the cuneiform script. So the Mesopotamian cuneiform script, most of it is by now gone. It's not extant anymore, but there's a writing. And you can see the symbols up there. The sun, moon, and stars. So on the right, this is Ishtar, the, the star, Venus. Uh, there's a winged sun disk in the middle, and there is the moon on the left. We will see better pictures later on. They are there because they are kind of the patron deities of, of the Babylonian kings. Yeah. So look at that. Here is an inscription written by the ancients with the sun, the moon, and the stars. So I was saying to myself, when the book, when the author of Jubilees wrote this, this is what he had in mind, something like that. And you have inscriptions like that spread around the region. So let's look at some examples and see whether that hypothesis holds. In my mind, it does, but I'll try to convince you. OK, this is becoming very actual. We are speaking about the history of Lebanon now. So I'm, yeah, in these days, as I said, let's all have hope that things will be peaceful again. So actually, the king, Babylonian kings, and so earlier than Nabunai, the king, the famous king, Nebuchadnezzar II, spent much of his reign in the Lebanon. Of course, Babylon is further to the east, southeast, but he was going to conquer the entire Levant, and he spent much of his reign in Lebanon fighting wars in the Levant. Uh, and he also commemorated his acts in Lebanon in quite a few monuments. Do I have it here on the map here? No, I will see it later on. So for example, this is a very unique site in Lebanon, just north of Beirut, called Nar El Kalb. This site, just north of Beirut, has monuments by every ruler who ruled Lebanon from Ramses II, the Egyptian king, until Napoleon III in the 19th century, and quite a few later. Uh, so this is a huge, Disneyland of Lebanese history. So it's a material site. It's on the two slopes of the Vadi, the river that flows into the sea, Nar El Kalb. And it, there are dozens of monuments just on the two sides of the rock. Uh, and the other side, the northern one, which is, no, you can't see it. So the northern one is all the way up there. That cliff carries an inscription by King Nebuchadnezzar. By King Nebuchadnezzar saying that King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Lebanon and so on and so forth and conquered the region and so on and so forth. We will see more of it. So this is really a prominent landmark in the region. Whoever lives in Lebanon knows about Nar El Kalb. Lots of literature, scholarly literature. It's actually a very interesting encounter of text and material. Here are a few more inscriptions, not on Nar el Kab, but elsewhere in Lebanon, that the recent Spanish uh, Assyriologist found. Look at them. They were not known. She was looking after it, and she found them. So it's interesting that these rock reliefs, they're not always in public places. Often they are found in very secluded rocks. And if that is the reason, why are they there anyway? If it's not about propaganda for people to see, why are they there? mostly for the gods to see, the gods of Nebuchadnezzar for them to see. And you got the motifs here. So this is once again the king with the sun, moon, and stars. And over there at the top right, you have an image of the king fighting a lion. Why is the king fighting a lion? Because the king provides protection to his state by means of controlling nature very typical Mesopotamia, more Assyrian, but I guess we see here it's also Babylonian. Now we're going to another site. 
in Lebanon, actually a much more public site, it's called Brisa, with reliefs on both sides of the river. And this is what remains of Brisa today. That's very sad. Yes, that's very sad. This is what remains of Brisa today. Uh, people have been erasing the inscription and erasing the relief. Can you see anything there? You can't see much. And this is after it has been cleaned by Rocio da Riva. You can't see much. Fortunately for us, the place was visited by a German explorer in the beginning of the 20th century, and he drew what he's found. He took photos. That's not much better, but it is better. And so you can see in Brisa, there are two reliefs, monumental big reliefs on two sides of the river. This is one of them. What do you see in the relief from the outline? This is what survives. A king fighting a lion. Uh, and you can still see the remains of cuneiform writing. So cuneiform writing, you can see that. Uh, and here is the other side, which we can't anyway understand anything now. But once again, if we look at it, what do you see? You see the king, yes, on the right-hand side with this conical cap of the king. What does he do? He's cutting a tree. He's cutting a tree, and there is a cuneiform inscription there too, on both sides, yes? You can see there is a cuneiform inscription as well. So the king fighting a lion, the king cutting a tree, uh, very typical of, uh, of um, yes, here it is, cutting a lion, fighting a tree, very typical of the Babylonian propaganda. The king is controlling nature, the forces of nature. He's fighting the lion, and he's cutting the trees, the cedars of Lebanon. He's cutting the cedars of Lebanon, and he uses them as material in his temples in Babylonia, because Babylonia is marshland and does not grow trees. So he needed, so this is part of the message of the king, that the king has control over the powers of nature. Later on, the Ju Judean prophets, when they oppose the empires, they would oppose the way that the king rules nature, exploits nature. Anyway, so why am I showing all of this to you? So I think that much, all of this iconography, all of these monuments have a very important part in the way that these apocalypses, apocalyptic stories came to be. So let us look, for example. But first, this is the inscription, a part of the inscription of the Nuchadnezzar wrote there. You can read it, but you should remember that neither one of the Lebanese observers of that inscription knew how to read it. Not even at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, I guess, Shalom, I think, the locals wouldn't understand it. And absolutely not in the Hellenistic period, 200, 300, 500 years later, they wouldn't understand how to read it. So this is basically nothing. So what, what do they see for them? They see this large image and they see ancient writing. The writing doesn't mean anything to them. Cuneiform was by then lost. Maybe a few people in Babylon could read it, but nobody else could. So what does this image convey to them? What sense does it convey to them? Uh, it conveys a sense of authority. They gathered it might have been early kings. What is whatever is written there? It's a message of power. It might be a message of knowledge, civilization. Maybe they thought about it as ancient you know, knowledge conveyed to them on the rock, maybe. But it really conveys a message of power. This is, well, this is, it's monumental. It's very big. These are monuments. So uh, Babylonian kings were exploiting, uh, Mesopotamian kings were exploiting the cedars of Lebanon, like in this Assyrian uh, relief. Uh, these are the cedars. They are very big. Um, but now, since we looked at this image of the king cutting a tree, have a second look at that. Okay, the king cutting a tree. Let's now read one of the apocalyptic texts. Actually, I was going to read this first. This is a text from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel says, an holy angel falls down from heaven and he says, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip its leaves and scatter its fruit. So when you read this verse from Daniel chapter four, actually, and you look at that image, it's really that image, isn't it? Uh, so if I am right in my suggestion, and I will try to, to put it forth further, so the literary imagination took these images, these ones or ones like them, or something that was in the cultural memory, 
and reinterpret created a reinterpretation of the story. This is really not about Nebuchadnezzar, an ancient king. This is what is who is this giant there? It's a giant falling, it's an angel falling from heaven and cutting the tree. Look, this is what he's doing. Now look, for example, at this dream. This is another version of the Book of Giants. It's a long story. How come? It is a different version, but you should believe me that it is. And uh, so the giants are dreaming dreams. And he saw a great stone covered the earth. And the earth was marked all over with lines upon lines of writing. An angel came and with a knife obliterated the lines leaving but four letters upon the stone. And the other son saw in a dream a large pleasure grove planted with all sorts of trees, but angels approached bearing axes, and they felled the trees, sparing a single one with three of its branches. So I'm saying, look, if you read the, the imagery of the Book of Watchers and of the Book of Giants and of the Book of Daniel, that imagery really relates very strongly to those reliefs that you have in Lebanon. So that was really part of their regional cultural memory. And many of the elements in the, yes, many of the elements can be understood like that. So for example, in that book of giants, you have this story about, in my dream I was watching and there was a large garden planted with all sorts of trees and it had gardeners and they were watering the tree and then the gardeners were felling the trees and then he's asking Enoch, what is the meaning of the story? And Enoch said to him, with regard to the gardeners that came down from heaven, these are the watchers who have come down. So what are, who are those images who are tending the trees and then later cutting the trees or destroying the trees? This all relates to some kind of ancient mythology that revolves around the forest of cedars in Lebanon. Uh, and those angels that fell, up, fell from heaven and cut the trees. So it's a, it's a case of the literary imagination. Now, how do you read this king fighting a lion? How do you read that into the stories of the Watchers? First of all, this is the Book of Giants talking about an Ish Bara. So of the, wild, the voice of the wild beast had come and the wild man they call me. This is very similar to Gilgamesh as well, but this is really in Aramaic, yes? And see, here is a wild man fighting the beasts of the earth. Uh, and this is once again Daniel chapter 4 with the king sent to live with the beasts of the field. And the, once again you get in one Enoch chapter 7 about how the giants when they came, they devoured the beasts of the field and the birds and so on. So if you try to connect it all together, and I think in the way that I handle my time, I should really start collecting the threads together. So first of all, I should say that uh, uh, you, we should think about how text on monuments is conceived. The people who read, who looked at these, these monuments, the big ones that we saw, they saw text on them. The text was not intelligible. Actually, you saw that there were two monuments in Brissa. It, they had the same text, one of them in new cuneiform, the other one in old Babylonian cuneiform, like a thousand years old cuneiform. The same inscription written in two different styles of script, of Babylonian script, which means that the idea of the text on the monuments was really not the content of the text. We, of course, read the content, and that's really interesting for us. But for the observers, there was an effect of that text that meant that conveyed the sense of monumentality and conveyed the sense of authority. And I think it also conveyed the sense of ancient wisdom, a sense of, of, look, we know how to write. Writing is not self-understood, yes. We know how to write and rewrite important things and put them on the rock and they're big and monumental. A lot of that sense is also retained in the new interpretation that I am envision. So they actually did relate to the old material that was on the walls, but they recreated it in a different way. Then think about these rock monuments. The one that I saw from, the one I, yeah, I showed you in the beginning from Jordan. There is an interesting archeologist, he's Turkish, but he works in the US, Omur Harmansa. So he's talking about these rock cut big monuments as straddling the border of nature and culture. Think about them. Think about Nahr el Kalb. Or yes, where is it? Or think about, yes, this thing. It's been there for millennia. 
by now it's standing there for 200, 2,600 years. Or think about these ones. They are in a way part of, they are part of the natural landscape of Lebanon, yes? But are they man-made? Yes, they are human-made, but they're also there as part of the, na the nature of Lebanon. Uh, so they convey a special sense of authority, and as material objects, they carry special interesting places. They also place them in interesting places, in, in this river, um, and so on and so forth. I could speak about it for many hours, but I try to limit myself to that. So they are special items placed in special places, and therefore they attract special attention, and they could generate new interpretations like I'm suggesting today. As we move on with the slides, back to where we were. This is an interesting project that takes place in New York, just a bit north of us at the Columbia University, with Zaina Baharani running a big mapping of Mesopotamian monuments. Uh, and she also maps these, the ones that I showed here today, but many others. Uh, she's an art historian who has developed a very interesting theory of how to think about that kind of material rock cut monuments. This is actually not a good example, but there are some very other good examples to show. Um, rock monuments uh, use, yes, I missed the word there. Rock monuments are the regional cultural memory of Lebanon and the Levant. So this is really part of the regional memory, those big images, like the kings cutting the trees, the king fighting the lion, and the inscriptions around them. They are really part, People in Lebanon have been speaking about them, and we will see some examples about that. Uh, and they connect to an ancient regional myth about the cedar forest. A Syriologist would say that Gilgamesh going to the cedar forest actually is an old West Semitic myth. See Andrew George Page, whatever. I mean, it's, it's there. Uh, the visual scenes are presented as a dream. That's a nice, interesting str strategy for the author. It's a visual scene, but he says, Yes, I had the dream, and in the dream I saw an angel falling down from heaven. So it's a kind of, it's a nice way to transform the actual scene, the actual visual material scene, to transform it into a text through a dream. The author assigns a new value to the image. Does it, re does it replace the old value? This is what the famous art historian Irene Winter asked me. Does it replace the old value? So I said the message of the new value encompasses the same themes of the old interpretations. Imperial kings, civilization, writing, violence against human can, violence against nature, ancient wisdom. It retains the same themes. I don't think, I mean, people knew that these are ancient Babylonian kings, but they could also at the same time see them also as an, like a second sense to the same idea. Actually, the apocalyptic books work in two scenes. They work in primordial times and they work in the courts of the great kings. So here we are bridging, yes, Nebuchadnezzar and the times of antiquity, Nebuchadnezzar and the watchers. And then actually, when you look at, this is a very small relic of what we have from Lebanese literature of antiquity. So Phoenician literature of antiquity, we have very little, precious little, and this is an author, Philo Biblos, not the famous Jewish Philo of Alexandria, but rather uh, Philo the Phoenician, writing in the second century CE. And he says about those primordial pre-flood pre figures, and they begot sons who in size and eminence were greater than their fathers. And his names were given to the mountain ranges over which they ruled as the Cassios, the Lebanon, the anti-Lebanon. So these are ancient figures like he doesn't call them fallen angels, but he calls them semi-divine ancient figures who gave their names to the great mountains of Lebanon. Here is on the right hand side, this is a text from Qumran. It's a Jewish text. He speaks about the fallen angels. They went about in the willful heart. The angels of the heaven fell and were ensnared, for they did not observe the commandment of God. Their sons, who were tall as the cedars of Lebanon, and their bodies were big as the mountains. So they also acknowledge the connection with the cedars and the mountains of Lebanon. Uh, yeah, I'm going back instead of going forth, and you want to finish. Uh, this is the map of the area. 
this is these are the Lebanon mountains in the middle. This is the, we call it the anti-Lebanon, so facing the Lebanon. The Hermon here is on right here. This is the south part of the anti-Lebanon. Uh, this is the north of Israel, places like Dan and Banyas that are mentioned in the Book of Enoch. So people before me had said already that the Book of Enoch comes from that northern region. And let's see some other evidence for that. But this is where we should look for as the origin of these myths. Here is a nice, interesting, later inscription for the Hermon region, a Greek inscription that uses whatever, an interesting divine epithet, the greatest holy god that works very well in Aramaic and appears in Enoch you know, a lot, you know, many times. Um, the myth of watchers is a product of the Lebanon Hermon region and the slopes of that bridge is in the upper Galilee. In the third century BC, this region was populated by ethnic Phoenicians or other people with strong Phoenician culture. People in Lebanon were concerned with the presence of older kings. They connected the memory with that of primordial times. But how did it reach the Jews? That's my question. If this is Phoenician mythology, so how did it appear in the Jewish book of Enoch with the story, the biblical story of the fallen angels? How should we make sense of that? The Jewish version of the myth of the watchers is taking part, so participating in the mythology of the Levant. So Jews were not living on a secluded island. They were taking part and they were creating and generating mythology just like their neighbors. Jews created their own version of this pan Levantine myth, connecting it with the story in Genesis chapter six. It's an act of cultural participation while maintaining a local hue of the tradition. That's the way intercultural relations actually work. You take part in a larger culture and you create your own version of it. I think we will skip that for the minute because that's less important. Uh, and I will thank you for your participation this evening. Thank you very much. And we have time for some questions. Just raise your hand if you have a question for Jonathan. Deborah. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll start with a question. So would you consider the these monuments graffiti? Ah, <laughs> well, we had a graffiti expert here yesterday. Well, this is very different from graffiti. Yes. It's, I mean, it's interesting that you asked, but that's, it's, it's a good contrast for us. It's the, like, it's the, it's the exact opposite of graffiti, which, which, this is huge. I mean, this is the Brissa thing. Where is it? This one. This is 2.8 meters high. So it's larger than life. Uh, and it's very deliberate. And the right, I mean, my sense of graffiti, I may be, you know, we may be thinking differently, but my sense of graffiti is like, like a visitor who passed by and wrote his name just to, uh, to show I was here. This is, very, this is royal work. These are artisans who were hired and they were experts and they did that. And carving cuneiform in rock is a very delicate job and you can easily, you know, you know, curve it and break uh, and, and make a mistake or whatever. So this is, this is royal prerogative. So very deliberate, very like a luxurious act. And the fact that it remained there for millennia. Actually, what were these kings seeking? What was Nebuchadnezzar seeking? When he placed his relief up there on the rock where nobody sees it, what was he seeking? He was seeking eternal immortality. immortality. And he got, you know, actually he did. <laughs> Because we today speak about, you know, the, the Nebuchadnezzar reliefs to more than two millennia after he went away. So we are fulfilling his will in, in a sense. Yes, but, but thank you. It made, the point made me give another, another idea. I think there was a lady here with a question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. My question in relationship with this, was this a secret? Hmm. Because most people, A, couldn't read, or B, didn't see it. They were working on the ground. Yes. but So mm -hmm. who else knew it was there? I mean, people built it or carved it, or did those people survive? Maybe he didn't want them to survive and tell people. So look, some of these places, like, where are they? Some of these are, yes, these are not too big, and they are placed in secluded places. Uh, for example, the, uh, like, not, but let me give you an example of the great 
Assyrian king, Sennacherib, who wrote, who, who left a huge series of reliefs at the origin of the river Tigris. Uh, in like a cave in the hills at the origin, nobody sees it there. It's really, it's really not seen by anyone. And that is a message for the gods. That one is a, it's not, it's a message for the gods. This one, I mean, Brisa is very public, is very public. This, the road is going between those two reliefs on the two sides of the valley. So this one is really very public. You can't miss it. So that one is, is really not a secret. I could say that the mode of interpretation, that could be a secret. So the way you deduce from this the story about the fallen angels, that's a secret. And there is a sense in these, in these apocalyptic books saying, look, you want to hear the story of the watchers from me because if, it wasn't, if you hadn't been reading the book of Enoch, you wouldn't know about the story. So I'm revealing that secret to you. Uh, there is a sense that the older Mesopotamian book of Gilgamesh has that same sense too. You have to read what you read now in the myth that I'm now telling you. You wouldn't have known otherwise. Uh, I am now telling you what happened at the time of the flood because if you didn't read it, you, so this is the sense of telling the secrets. I'm sorry, maybe I didn't understand. First, thank you very much for the, the great uh, statement that you made, the, the great expose. But I did not understand something. Um, when you were talking about the writing on the rocks, the one in Aramaic and non-Aramaic, are we able to read what is said on the mm -hmm. rock or okay. no? So, thank you. Uh, it's important clarification. The text written on the rock, it's in Babylonian language, it's not, so not Aramaic, but Babylonian. It's written in the cuneiform Babylonian script. Today, we have a seriologist like Professor Holtz here who can read that text, and so we can understand that, that therefore I brought you, you know, the actual translation. At the time, it was really an act of propaganda, but it wasn't really meant to be read. Very few people could read it. People in Lebanon, they couldn't, I guess, maybe you think differently, but people in Lebanon mostly could not read that cuneiform script and understand it. So placing that text there was a matter of power, you know, a statement of power more than conveying the actual sense of the text. But could it be power or could it be something religious? I don't know what it was said on the text. <laughs> but I imagine that it could be a sacred location, maybe where there were rituals taking place, mm -hmm. for example. So, okay. First of all, this is what is written. Not all of it, but some of it is here. And the message that's written here is a message of political propaganda. I am your king, I am benevolent, I am protecting you, and also look how powerful I am because I can cut the trees of Lebanon and bring them to my own capital city. Were there also rituals taking place there? Actually, that's an interesting question, and research today has been asking these questions. So we should always look at these texts as kind of multidimensional. First of all, they're not only abstract texts, they are material things on the rock, but also are they... Is there anything there beyond the text on the rock? So people are saying, okay, in some very few cases, you see, you can hear about rituals taking place next to these rock monuments. Actually, not in Lebanon, but more in Anatolia. In Turkey of today, there are many rock uh, you know, monuments left by the Hittites. And you have some evidence about rituals taking place next to these reliefs in the Roman period. That's interesting. Yeah, so there is this sense of afterlife. I, I had an opportunity to edit a book with a colleague of mine, an archaeologist from, from Brown University, where we spoke about the afterlives of these monuments because they were carved at some moment in history. But then they had millennia of, of life and all sorts of other things happened to them after that. Rituals was really one of them. It could be, okay, if I'm referring to the Roman, for example, okay, Augustus left, if I remember, a lot of stones where he wrote exactly what he was doing, okay, and what he did for mm -hmm. the Roman. Yeah. And in fact, when I'm reading this inscription there, it's a little bit what he's saying, 
I mean, yes, but that's, and, and, that's for yeah. 600 years before Augustus. Yeah, no, 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 before, exactly. Yeah. So, but I mean, Augustus was doing it as a propaganda and a way for him, for people to remember what he has been doing. So maybe it could be a kind of propaganda. Of course, yeah. yes, yes. But Augustus wrote it in Latin and people could understand. But and this was written yeah. in beautiful script where place yeah. where. Any other questions? Well, I hope you'll all join us for the third lecture tomorrow night. But for now, please join me in thanking Jonathan Bendoff. Thank you.